And that is how it ought to be. Only the military could achieve that. And we ought to be able to look at that and see how we can bring it about. Because this is what gives hope to the nation. We must take down the boundaries that divide us. That is what military rule achieved for our country. The creation of states so that various communities could advance at their own pace and feel free was achieved by the military. The creation of local governments. We have all together in this country today 774 local governments and area councils. We owe that to the military. If we are happy with the states, if we are happy with the local governments, we must commend the military. I, I, I am happy that I'm called upon to speak about homegrown solutions. If we have not yet come to that, to the realization, we are gradually coming to it, that as much as we have a great deal to learn from the rest of the world, we too have something to teach. No one should talk in terms of superiority. No race is superior to another. No race has a monopoly either of knowledge or of ignorance. And therefore, no race or people should kneel at the feet of another. And, and that is what has happened to us. As much as I acknowledge the great achievements of other races of mankind, I also bear witness that culturally and spiritually, the black race has offered much to the world and has still a great deal to offer. Talking about homegrown solutions, this is the time to look inwards. Now, when we idolize the ancestors of other nations and regard our own ancestors as barbarians, this is the time to look inwards. And this is true. I idolize Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is what I do. But I regard my own ancestors as barbarians. It ought not to be so. Now, when we wear foreign clothes, as you see me wearing, now that we speak in a foreign language, as I am doing, If you go all over this city, you will see all the restaurants that have been set up so that we can eat foreign foods. When I get back home, my children ask for pizza, which is foreign. They ask for ice cream, which is foreign. They ask for shawarma, which is foreign. And so, we are slowly, slowly deculturizing the nation. I am ashamed to confess this, but it is true. My own children have difficulty speaking my language. And many homes are like that. So it is a good thing that this center is thinking about 
homegrown solutions. The time has long since come for us to look inwards for solutions. The attempt at doing so will be costly. Mistakes will be made. Sacrifices are called for. Unless we make those sacrifices, we shall never be able to bequeath to generations to come this great heritage that is ours. Our problem is not one of ideas. There is no shortage of ideas. Our problem is one of action. Ideas, however good they are, are not self-implementing. We must implement them ourselves or get others to implement them. One of the greatest calamities that befell the nation is, this, is the fact that those who have good ideas are not allowed to implement them. Whereas those who have no ideas whatsoever are able to manipulate themselves into office and keep out of office those who have good ideas. During the slave days of America, a little boy is reputed to have put a question to his teacher. He said, my father is a slave. Just as our country today is in bondage, that's where we are. We are in bondage. And this boy said to the teacher, my father is a slave, and he has done everything required of him by law to be free, yet he remains a slave. What more is he to do? That is a question that we can ask ourselves. But then, have we done everything required of us to be free? We have not. We are not prepared to make the sacrifices that will ensure our freedom. We are like those Jews who said, take us back to the Egypt of our slavery because we will rather have the flesh pots of slavery than pay the price for freedom. We are not making the sacrifices that we need to make. And until we begin to make those sacrifices, our country will continue in the downward trend that it has been for 60 years. From time to time, we rose, as you heard Chief Ali say, and that is true. But again and again, we have fallen because we are in love with the flesh parts of slavery. And we are reluctant or unable to make the sacrifices that are necessary for freedom. I, I always thank my father for one thing. As a child, I was always hungry. And when I cried to him, he said, and please, I would like us to remember this. He said, when you are hungry, bear it. If you are hungry here, don't go and eat there. Do you understand? And I said, yes. Our country is not observing that rule. When we are hungry, we go to China for food. 
We import rice from Taiwan. We import rice from India. We are not willing to cultivate our soil by ourselves, as fertile as it is. We refuse The, the transformation of our country is going to begin when we endeavor to be self-reliant. When we begin to make those sacrifices that other nations made in order to invent, to produce the luxuries that we are enjoying. When you look at the type of cars that we are driving, you know that this nation is going nowhere. Everything is important. Please. And my appeal to the government, if we are going to have homegrown solutions, is to shut the borders. We must shut the borders. When you look at the nations that we are uh, trying to emulate today, the nations that we call great, how, how did they come to become great? When Japan decided to uh, pave a new path for itself, the first thing it did was to shut her borders. Japanese intellectuals who advocated open borders were in prison. How did China become great? China became great by, uh, become, by, by shutting her borders, by producing by herself the things she needed. How did Mahatma Gandhi become great? Or how did India become great? India became great by endeavoring to produce by herself the things she needed. We all remember the salt march which was undertaken by Mahatma Gandhi as a protest against British rule in order that India could be self-reliant. Are we able to do that? If we can't do that, we cannot have homegrown solutions. When you look at history, I was telling you a moment ago, I, I, I hear noises here and there, very kindly, very, very kindly, I will appreciate it if we all sit down and listen. We are here to honor General Abacha, and we must do so, please. I, I see we are serving food. Have we not eaten enough? The, the problem of the nation is really that we are eating too much. And when you get to a ceremony like this where we are trying to honor our great men, what do we do? We start eating, we start drinking, we start talking. We don't listen. The nation must eat less and work more. I was telling you a moment ago about Mahatma Gandhi. In 1978, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated when I was barely two years old. But in 1978, I traveled all the way to India to pay my tribute to Mahatma Gandhi. Why? Because 
Gandhi spoke for a generation that he never knew. So when that generation was born, they paid tribute to him. After that, I traveled to Atlanta to pay tribute to Martin Luther King. Why? He spoke for peace. He spoke for, for, for nonviolence. That is what leaders are being remembered for. The sacrifices that they made. Why do we remember the philosopher, the Arab philosopher, Sayyid Ali? Sayyid Ali said, the rights that you have over others, forget them. The rights that others have over you, remember them. We, re we forever, the world will remember Sayyid Ali. Why do we remember the Prophet Muhammad? His teachings on submission, on surrender. And that is why the religion is called Islam. The religion of submission, of surrender. Leaders have been remembered for the things that they said. Why do we remember Jesus? He said, the birds have their nests. The foxes have their hoods. But the Son of Man had no resting place. We remember him for sacrifice. Why do we remember St. Paul? St. Paul said, I have been all things to all men that by all means I might win a few. Is that easy? Being all things to all men. So please, our leadership must begin to think of policies and programs that will benefit not just this generation, but generations to come. They must speak. The leader is not going to be remembered for infrastructures. No. There is not a single leader who has been remembered of the past. Julius Caesar is not remembered for infrastructures. Alexander the Great is not remembered for infrastructures. But those leaders, they are remembered for the things that they said. What are our leaders saying now? Even right now, in their own lifetime, we are unable to remember what they are saying. They must speak. They must unite the nation. And that is why this nation adopted the presidential system of government. That system of government in which all power is vested in one man so that he can use that power to bind the nation together. The governor of Kebbi is here. In the states, all power is vested in the governor. Why is that so? So that he can use that power to bind the people, to compel them to walk. On the contrary, what has happened in this country is we have fostered patronage. The federal government, the state governments, the lo local governments are founded on patronage. You have to belong to the party. You have to know the governor. You have to know the president. You have to know the minister. That is the only hope that you have. And so, people are not striving for merit. They are looking for various opportunities to be patronized. And that has entrenched in our country a culture of flattery. Is that not correct? Are we not guilty of flattery? We are flattering all the time so that we can belong. 
So my appeal to the nation, we are talented people. We are gifted people. We are a nation of geniuses. Nigerians are serving in the cabinets of other nations. They are in the American cabinet. And they are in the British cabinet. We are very intelligent. Very patient. Unrelenting. Persevering. We have all that. A hard-working and God-fearing nation. That's what we are. But we must put that talent to use. We don't want to be like that man in the Bible who was given a talent and he went and buried it. And when they asked him where it was, he said, well, I buried it. Nigeria is burying her talent. Who is making that noise, please? We must stop talking. We must listen. That's why we are here. We don't have a sense of history. Why? Because we are not listening. We are not reading. Many of us here do not know the great achievements of General Abacha. Well, we don't care. A nation without a sense of history, a nation without a sense of family, a divided nation is going nowhere. We stigmatize the nation as an artificial creation. Do you know a nation that is not artificial? All nations are artificial. So stop branding the nation as artificial. Stop stigmatizing it as artificial. Stop, stop scandalizing it as, as an, an, an artificial nation created by the, by the British. All nations are artificial. That's what they are. England is, America is, Australia is, the French are, the Spanish are, and so is Nigeria. Then we reject the Constitution. You reject the Constitution? We have a Constitution. We regard it as the product of the military. It is our constitution. We can amend it. If you regard it as a broken down vehicle, it is the only one you have. Repair it and move on. If you reject the Constitution as the product of the military, are you going to reject the states? Are you going to reject the local governments that they created? Are you going to reject the National Assembly that they established? Are you going to reject the presidency? The government is founded on the Constitution, and we cannot afford to reject it. And please, we are better off as we are, from east to west, from north to south. And we ought to be looking forward to that day when the nations of Africa will join in this union that is Nigeria. When Cameroon, Gabon, the Ivory Coast, Zai, the nations of the Ab 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 Arab world will come together in a United States of Africa. We shouldn't be thinking in small terms, in divided terms. 
Divided we stand. Is that correct? No. Divided we fall. United we stand. We must unite. Unity is not going to do us any harm. Unity has never done harm to any nation or any people. What harms a people is division. Division is an evil. And evil does not select. You may be agitating for a Fulani state. When that Fulani state comes, they start fighting themselves. You may be agitating for a Yoruba state, an Igbo state. When that state comes, then you find those people fighting themselves. No, we must unite. The greater we are, the better. And one of the problems of the nation today is this. The fact that the states are so small that one individual can pocket them, manipulate them, exploit them. Is that not correct? It is correct. The states are too small. There's nothing wrong with combinations. We must come together. We must unite. We must pool our resources. And that's the hope we have. That we can move forward. That we can have homegrown solutions. We must give our children the kind of education that will equip them for life. Right now, the education we are giving to our children makes them proud, makes them distant. It is, it is academic, it is theoretical. They can't use their hands. So these are the things that we must do. Do you agree? Thank you. We have, we have, we have, and we have, I cited to you, the great men of other nations. I spoke of Ghana. But we have great men. The people we assassinated were great men. That Tafawa Balewa was a great man. <laughs> it doesn't matter that we assassinated him. He was a great man. What did he do wrong? Sir Amadou Bello was a great man. We assassinated him, but that does not take away his greatness. It is just like when we crucified Jesus. We assassinated Festus Okotiebo. We assassinated S.L. Akintola. What did he do wrong? One of the greatest men in my mind is Fadri, Colonel Fadri, who laid down his life, a Yoruba man, for an Igbo man. That is an example. that we must not forget. We want Fulanese to lay down their lives for Yorubas. We want Yorubas to lay down their lives for Igbos. We want Igbos laying down their lives for, for houses. Why not? That is the Nigeria of my dream. That is the homegrown Nigeria. <clears throat> you, 
You know all these things that I'm talking about. You know them all. But what is the problem that we have? It is one of implementation. You know all our problems. And you know all the solutions. Our future, our nation, is ours to build. Nobody is coming to build it for us, please. And we must begin to admit that we are all implicated in the downfall of our country. We are all implicated. The cook, the steward, the driver, the minister, the legislator, I dare not say the president. <laughs> but the truth is, we are all implicated. And until we recognize that we are implicated, until we repent, until we return to the Lord, the prodigal son said, I will arise and return to my father. He gave us a prayer. And we should, Nigeria should pray that prayer now and say, Nigeria will arise and return to her father or to his father. If we go on thinking that, oh, the problem is a bacha, the problem is a basanjo, the problem is Babangida, the problem is Murutala Muhammad, then we assassinate him. Why? The problem is ours. We are all guilty. I was Attorney General in 1999 when the nation returned to civil rule. And I can tell you that the pendulum swung from one end of dictatorship to the other end of liberalism, whereby Nigerians feel free to do as they please. That is our misconception of democracy, the right to do as you please. That's not the meaning of democracy. Our elections are not free. Our elections are not fair. Am I lying? No. And until we have fair elections, until the elections are transparent, we will not be able to produce the genuine leaders of the nation. The elections must be transparent. St. Paul said, and he left us that lesson. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the grace of God. Whatever office you hold, if you are a governor, you must be able to say, I am a governor by God's grace. If you are a president, you must be able to say, I am a president by God's grace. Whatever office you hold, if you cannot give the credit to the Lord, you should give it up. Our elections are not fair. They must become fair. Our politics is dominated by money. Is it not? It is. And as long as it is dominated by, the, by money so that the poor have no say, that's no dem democracy. We are talking about homegrown solutions. We have destroyed our cultural institutions. Do we have villages anymore? No, we don't have villages anymore. Why? These cultural institutions have been destroyed. We are free <clears throat> to watch television from day to night. 
And now, when I was in India in 1978, as I was telling you, uh, uh, television shot at 10 p.m. After 10 p.m., you could not watch television. Apart from the fact that what they were showing on television during the day were things that would educate India. Today, we fear for our children. Why? Television. Nothing is controlled. We are deculturized. We have destroyed our cultural institutions. Have we not? We have. So we are talking about homegrown solutions, while at the same time destroying our roots. <clears throat> But how did all this start? How is it that a nation of geniuses, a hard-working nation, a God-fearing nation, because that is the truth. Nigerians are God-fearing. We are a very God-fearing nation. And that's why the nation survives. If we were not God-fearing, this nation would have perished long ago. We are God-fearing. And clap for yourselves for that. How did this start? How, how, how did we fall? It started in 1966 when we committed the abomination of killing those who held power and taking it. Is that not an abomination? It is. It is a great abomination. That's how it started. Then it led to war. It created manpower problems. We created states. We went from four states to 36 states. We have 774 local governments and area councils. Many of us are probably surprised that our keynote speaker held us spellbound for almost an hour, even though he is over 70. That the young man stood here 